This is Mark McNeese, and you're listening to One Thing or Another, Interviews and Conversations. Welcome to the One Thing or Another podcast. This is your host, Mark here, and today I have the pleasure of talking with a returning guest. It is author Garrett Hudson, who was last on in October when his book Grey Pre was coming out. I believe that is the case. Garrett, yes. how are you? T- yeah, how are you today? I'm good. How are you, Mark? I'm fine. We were talking before uh, recording that you're in Indianapolis, ish, uh-huh. in the area. Are you actually in the city or outside? Of yes, the city? we are. Yep, we are on the north side of Indianapolis. And I am in uh, rural New Jersey, and um, I was saying that it's cold today, but your your heat is coming this way, because on Wednesday it's going to be in the 80s. Mm-hmm. i got to get out there and start working on the garden, which is I love to do, but it's also kind of daunting, at least until I get the um, the garden ready for it. I hear a kitty. Yeah, he's, uh, <laughs> of course, because we're recording, he had to come in here and start making his presence known. <laughs> well, it would either be yours or mine. We have two cats, and uh, Wilma is the chatty one. Peanut doesn't uh, talk, she squeaks, she has a little tiny squeak, but Peanut meows and yaps, and um, uh, a lot of times wants to be part of the conversation. But mm-hmm. We have two again. cats as well, and one of them is more vocal than the other, and that was the one that came in here, just... Wanted to make sure everybody knew he was here. Now, for uh, folks listening who maybe didn't hear the first time that we talked, give us a little bit of the rundown on Garrett Hudson and what's okay. new since October. Well, yeah, a bunch. It's actually been a busy time for me. Um, my name's Garrett Hudson. I live in Indianapolis. I am married. Um, my husband and I live in the Broad Ripple area of Indianapolis, which is a kind of fun little eclectic area on the north side. Um, I've been writing since I was a child. I've been publishing for almost five years now. Um, I've got seven books out now, uh, the sixth of which was Grey Prairie, which you mentioned earlier, that came out in the fall. And then my seventh book, uh, The Swiss Conspiracy, came out in March. Uh, so it has been a very busy time for me. Now, I'm just curious, by the way, do you, um, have, you, do you, have you done any audiobooks or is that something, does that interest you at all? It does. Um, I have not done audio to uh, to this point yet. I just started looking into it seriously about maybe two months ago on uh, the first book of my Shanghai Mystery series. Um, I actually put out a call for uh, narrators. I uh, haven't really found one that I think is right yet. Uh, I'm being kind of picky a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's been suggested to me that I narrate my own and, and I may do that. I don't know that I'm really convinced I want to, cause that's a big time commitment, but I, I I'm holding out that possibility. I may narrate my own at some point if I can't find a narrator that I'm pleased with. And well, now that we're talking shop, what, what service did you, did you, are you using? Uh, find away voices. Ah, find away voices. I just, I have um, 10 audio books out, and four of them are, are non-exclusive with ACX. I'm sure you've probably heard of ACX. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so I, I, those are, I could put it on any retailer, any platform, any distributor. So I've got four books that I have just, like in the last couple of weeks, put on Find Away Voices. Because I want to see how it goes. I'm doing mm-hmm. a new one, <clears throat> a new audio book, but I'm actually doing that through ACX. But do, I'm doing it as non-exclusive so I can put it anywhere I want to. Just because I've already got all of this back, uh, you know, this catalog on ACX. Mm-hmm. Um, and in terms of narrating your own, and because then I'll get into con- something that might actually interest the listeners. Um, it is huge. Have you ever narrated? Have you narrated anything for yourself? Mm-hmm. No, I haven't, um, and it's a, kind of a daunting possibility. It's really, uh, it's very time consuming. You've mm-hmm. got to meet the, you've got to meet the um, specifications, like especially for ACX and and Find Away Voices. So I'm just letting you know that it is a huge learning curve. It's a lot of work. I'm very impressed by people who uh, narrate audiobooks professionally because it's a lot of work. I mean, it's a lot of work. I yeah. did. I was doing just. I've been doing just some short stories. I. I Anyways, yeah, yeah. So think that through before you actually do that. <laughs> or you might you might do a couple chapters and say, you know, I'm, this is nuts. I'm going to get somebody who does this, you know, every day. Yeah, that's a good point. I could always try it out and don't have to, con- you know, I don't have to continue with it if it's not going well. 
because you got to stop. I mean, you you record, right. you got to go back over it constantly. Anyway, so I'm just putting that up now. Uh, back to more um, broader conversations. <laughs> mm-hmm. Can tell people about um, about the the series, the Great um, Pre series. I, this the spy catchers. I'm sorry, Swiss conspiracy is part yeah. of that. Yes. It is. It's the third book in its series. Um, I actually have two distinct series. Um, the The Shanghai Mysteries um, are, are completely separate. Uh, the Spycatcher series uh, centers a character called Martin Schuler, and he's an American spycatcher. And in book three of the series, this was Conspiracy, he kind of blurs the line a little bit between spycatcher and spy. Um, this is right on the verge of when the U.S. is getting ready to enter World War II, and things are getting a little bit hairy. And he's sent to Switzerland to uh, to find some spies in Switzerland and, and kind of ends up doing a little bit of spying on his own. So that was kind of fun to play with. Very good. And he, he um, I know that your books are LGBTQ inclusive. Um, Mm -hmm. not exclusive but inclusive Um, so can you talk a little bit about that yeah absolutely Um, with the spy catcher series Martin Schuler is a straight protagonist Um, but he has a tendency to get surrounded by people who are on the queer spectrum either gay or bi and there are several um, well there's a, a prominent secondary character who is a gay man and there's a prominent secondary character who's a bi man a bisexual man and um, they both play fairly big roles in this story. Uh, the bisexual man also is a crossover character from Grey Pri. Um, so those, while it's Grey Pri is not part of this series, it exists within the same universe. Um, and so I'm going to have characters kind of move back and forth between those two series uh, as I develop them. And that's been kind of fun as well. Now, I know that this, these, this is historical fiction. And I mm-hmm. want to ask you again. Uh, why historical fiction, and also what are some of your um, inspirations slash influences? Sure. Um, I've always loved history. It was always my favorite subject in school, and it's one of those things that I I continually want to learn more about, and, and I'm always you know, finding non, uh, nonfiction history books to read up on, and, and anytime I get excited by a particular setting that I'm reading about, I imagine a way to set a story there. The ones that inspire me the most are the the times and places where uh, queer folk came together and actually were able to form communities in spite of all the obstacles that exist for that. Um, and, and that did happen in the World War II era. Um, so, for example, with the Spycatcher series, Martin works at the State Department. And the State Department during the interwar period of the 1920s and 30s and into World War II was... Uh, fairly welcoming place for gay men and lesbians um, compared to society as a whole. Uh, There was a a reason the State Department kind of got a bit of a reputation for that. And when McCarthyism started to clamp down on LGBT folk in government service, the State Department was McCarthy's first target uh, in the late 40s. And um, and so I I set Martin in that setting, and that's one of the reasons why he always has a lot of gay people around him, even though he himself is straight. Do you um, what was I going to say? Um, oh, in terms of research, mm-hmm. what what sort of aside from reading historical fiction, what sort of specific research do you do if you do? Um, I'll find books on. Um I'll find books either on Amazon or Barnes and Noble that are about a particular time period and I'll read up on it. Um, There's also a lot of information online. Um, Obviously you can start with Wikipedia, but then you can dig a little bit deeper from there. Um, I've also been able to find a lot of information from the state department's office of the historian. They have uh, pretty much everything (laughs) that's not classified is out on their database. Um, And you can find all kinds of stuff. Um, copies of cables that went back and forth from embassies to Washington, memos um, that are presented verbatim. And it's a wealth of information that can really help bring some depth and realism to the stories. Now with Martin Schuler, um, is he, did any, did any particular person inspire him or how did you go about creating him? As a character? <laughs> so, that's kind of a funny story. Um, I first envisioned him kind of like a young Steve McQueen type. Um, And and you can still see echoes of that in his persona, but he really developed a lot more than that. Um, He's 
not quite the action hero that Steve McQueen clearly is, but there's still some inspiration there to him. Um, and some of the particulars of his biography, I actually borrowed from my own grandfather and his mother. Uh, and I kind of melded some biographical details of my grandfather and my great grandmother and, and gave those to Martin, uh, his particular background in the Pennsylvania Dutch culture, for example. Um, but yeah, he's, he's really kind of developed on his own. Um, I actually wrote the Swiss conspiracy first many, many moons ago, <laughs> about uh, 11 years ago was when I first started working on it. And then subsequently I went back and wrote the first two books of the series um, after I had written the Swiss conspiracy. So I had to go back to the Swiss conspiracy and make a lot of revisions based on those first two novels I had written. And over the course of all that, he really developed into a much more, um, I don't know, complex person. He uh, is a very principled individual. He has a very strong sense of right and wrong, but he also has a lot of emotional baggage um, and, and some some wounding he experienced when he was younger and some some harsh judgments he received for some youthful transgressions. And that, that kind of carries with him, and it's been fun to explore. I noticed um, <clears throat> that there's a content warning, sometimes mm -hmm. called a trigger warning. Yes. Um, I don't... I'm. It said the this the Swiss conspiracy contains a sequence involving torture in a Gestapo dungeon, including sexual assault, realistically portrayed and may be traumatic for certain readers. Um, mm -hmm. I've never included one of those. I, I'm just was curious about that because that was that's on Amazon. Yes, um, that was actually pointed out to me by one of my beta readers, and I'm I'm glad she pointed that out because I hadn't considered that, um, and I think that is good to warn. Uh, of that. I I believe in being realistic with historical fiction mm -hmm. and the Gestapo were pretty renowned for their very in-depth torture methods. There's been a lot written about that. Um, I didn't really make any of the particular methods up. I just, I made up the scene clearly and, and the sequence of it and, and the character, the villain that I've created to do that, um, it all kind of flowed out of his... Um, sadistic kind of tendencies um and i my beta reader pointed out that that could be traumatic for people who had experienced sexual assault for example so i thought it was a good idea to include that and if if that is triggering for somebody maybe this isn't the book for them yes that's a good idea i'm just i was just curious because i've never done that i I, I, I will be I will say in a like in a book description that it's a serial killer and and, mm -hmm. and and assume that people sort of know that serial killers kill people um, but anyways, I don't know. I was curious about that. Now, can, uh, um, can you talk a little bit about your, uh, schedule? I'm not big, I'm not a fan of the word process, but, uh, how do you write? Do you write a certain time every day? What, how does that work for you? Yeah, I, I write more in the evenings. I'm, I'm not a big morning person, honestly, and my brain takes a little while to get going first thing in the morning. Um, so especially during the week, um, you know, I, I have a day job like most writers do. And so I, I wouldn't be able to write effectively in the morning before work, so I write after work in the evenings. Um, now, on Saturdays, I might write in the morning because um, I can kind of take a little time on a Saturday to get you know, fully woken up and everything and sit down and then do a little bit of writing in the late morning. But typically, Monday to Friday, I write you know, 7, 8 in the evening. I'm exactly the opposite, and people <laughs> have asked me, why are you up at 4.30 in the morning? And it's because that's when I write, and I've been doing it for years. I have I have to have a clear head to to create, whether it's websites or whatever it is that I'm doing. And that window in the morning, those two hours, if I'm lucky, before mm -hmm. uh, on my days off, I can I could actually I can put six hours in at my desk on my day off. But when I have to go to work at seven, you know, seven in the morning, I'm up really early because I've got to have. A mind that hasn't been cluttered with all of the stuff that comes at me once I'm oh, sure. out there. But I've always been fascinated by people who work at night. Lots of people do. I mean, mm -hmm. I know I know people who are like up at two o'clock in the morning. I'm like, why are you still awake? But, um, <clears throat> oh, your writing process. Now I just totally see. I I was started talking about that and I lost my train of thought. <laughs> but um, what's next for you? Oh, okay. I am in the revision process right now on the third book for the Shanghai Mysteries. 
Um, and it still needs a bit of work. I had really hoped to have it out in the springtime, but it's, it's not going to, it's not going to congeal well enough. I don't think. Um, so I'm pushing that out to the summer. Um, so this is going to be a busy release year for me. Um, since I released one in October and another one in March, this will be three in less than a year. Um, but I'm really hoping to write something completely different here pretty soon. Um, so I've got three books in the Shanghai series, three books in the spy catcher series. Um, and I have written a second book, a sequel to uh, great Paris, which I'll get back to at some point, but I'm, I'm really kind of itching to do something a little bit different. Uh, and I've got a ton of ideas. Ideas is never the difficult part. It's, it's choosing the right idea. That's always the hard part. Uh, and, and right now I think I'm leaning towards doing something set in uh, like the bohemian section of Greenwich Village in the 1920s. Um, that was a really interesting time period. And there were some out and proud queer people that lived in Greenwich Village. And I thought, I've always thought that would be a fun time period to write about uh, the jazz age and everything like that. And, and that's kind of pulling me right now. Um, I've got an idea that I could set there. So we'll, we'll play with that some this summer. Are you going to go to the village to do some research? I'm hopefully <laughs> we're I'm getting my second shot here really soon. And, and my husband's had his, so I think we can probably travel this summer. Um, we just haven't decided where we're going to go for summer vacation yet. Now the village is one of my favorite places in New York. I've been there many times. Um, and I've got a friend that lives in the area that we can always go visit and we'll, you know, trek down to the village for an evening. Well, my husband and I, we're we're fully vaccinated now, and we're starting to go out to dinner in in in, in dining inside, which is nice with friends mm-hmm. and trips and that kind of thing. And I, I, um, you, I'm I'm sure I mentioned this last time, but we lived in New York City. We just moved uh, mm-hmm. to to New Jersey full time about three and a half years ago. But uh, I was curious about that, and we have not been to the city since the pandemic started. Um, the bus that comes out here isn't running and I don't want to drive into the city and it's just been, um, I have no idea what, what the cityscape is like right now. We have friends there, of course, but mm-hmm. um, I would not have wanted to go when it was so, so restricted. So I'm looking forward no. to going back in the next few months is what I'm saying. And, and just um, the, the new normal is not, it's never, nothing is going to be what it was, no. <laughs> you know, ever. I mean, it's true. wherever you go, it, there's, it will be different. Mm-hmm. So I'm looking forward to seeing New York City post uh, shutdown, I guess, post post pandemic. Yeah, me too. Now, is there anything you want to add? How can people find you? Um, you know, sure. Your, 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 um, your website, that sort of thing. Yeah, my website is GarrettHudson.com, and Garrett is with two R's, two T's, and Hudson is H-U-T-S-O-N. Um, that's probably the best place to find information about me and about my books. Um, you can find my books anywhere they're sold. I, I am wide. I'm not Amazon exclusive. So you can find books at Barnes and Noble, um, Apple, Kobo, et cetera. Um, and I also have a link on my website to sign up for my newsletter. Um, I send out a newsletter monthly um, and periodically additional ones if I have news um, but I'll send out a monthly newsletter letting people know what I've been working on, what I've been reading, and I'll give uh, reviews of things that I've read recently, too. And how do you like the writing life? Oh, I love it. <laughs> it can be frustrating, <laughs> of course, but it, it's so much a part of me. I can't imagine doing anything else. Do you design as well, like your covers? No, I don't. I have a good cover designer I like, um, and he designs my covers for me. And uh, we've been working together since the beginning. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Well, Garrett, it's been a, a pleasure to talk to you again. I'm, I yeah. feel renewed in the springtime and vaccinated. Mm-hmm. And it's uh, it's not what it was a year ago, that's for sure. <laughs> Thank um, goodness. Yeah, it's just been a delight to talk to you. And great uh, mm-hmm. you know, luck and success with the writing. And I get your Thank newsletter, you. so I will know what you're doing. <laughs> you know. And I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. So goodbye to the kitty and everything else, and uh, we'll stay in touch. All righty. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Thanks for coming on. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. This is Mark McNeese, and you've been listening to One Thing or Another, Interviews and Conversations. 